morning, all of you. A warm welcome to our Zoom webinar organized by GMOE 3 Knowledge Academy. Kindly mute your microphone and turn off the cameras during the presentation and use the chat box to clear your doubts at the end of every session. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mahesh J. Gamage, consultant eye surgeon currently attached to Columbano Teaching Hospital, Ragama. And his lecture is going to be on common eye conditions presenting to OPD setup. Over to you, sir. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, GMOA and uh, Sri Knowledge Academy for organizing this kind of series of lectures to improve the knowledge of our uh, medical officers and thereby to improve the patient care services. Today, uh, during my talk, I'll be talking about uh, common eye conditions presenting to OPD setup. <clears throat> As primary care physicians, what these all uh, other doctors should know and what they should do uh, when these conditions, then they met up with these conditions. Uh, during my slides, you will see a red star like this. And that means that is something which is really important and two things to remember and kind of take home messages. So just pay attention for those slides, uh, quite uh, vigilant about this red star. I'll be uh, first dealing with these common presentations, cataract, glaucoma, diabetic eye diseases, refractive errors, and ocular trauma. And what is cataract? Cataract is the loss of transparency in the human crystalline lens. <laughs> this is a schematic representation of the optics of the eye. When somebody is looking at an object and a mirror image is formed inside the uh, eye on the retina and these light rays converge to the what is called nodal point which is situated just behind the lens just behind the posterior capsule of the lens so as you can see the light rays converge here at the nodal point of the eye uh, in the human optics there are several morphological types of cataract and uh, most common is the nuclear cataract, which is sclerosis and uh, gradual loss of transparency within the central nuclear part of the cataract, or nuclear part of the lens. And there can be cortical cataract that is clouding in the cortical areas of the lens and maybe uh, clouding or opacification in the uh, posterior subcapsular area and uh, maybe posterior polar cataract and maybe anterior polar cataract or pyramidal cataract, or there may be kinds like uh, lamella cataract. So as you can see, not all these cataracts are visually significant. As I showed in the last slide, the nodal point of the eye lies just behind the posterior capsule. So uh, cataract like posterior polar cataract or posterior subcapsular cataract impairs light entering into the eye more than these cortical cataracts. On slit lamp examination, uh, there are so many morphological types of cataract that we can see. These are the sum of the cataracts as seen here. This is a total cataract, which is uh, a mature cataract. The entire lens is cataract as, as you can see here, or there can be nuclear cataract, just the central part of the nu uh, nucleus of the lens is cataract as, rest of the uh, lens is quite clear or can be anterior polar cataract where just the anterior pole is cataract as you can see here. So light can enter into the eye through the rest of the uh, lens or it can be posterior polar cataract or posterior subcapsular cataract where uh, it's just behind the uh, just anterior to the posterior pole and as you can see the rem remember the nodal point these uh, cataract can impair the vision to a greater extent. It can be lamellar cataract where only a certain lamella of the lens is cataract as you can see in uh, most of the congenital cataracts. And there are so many other kinds of cataract, uh, cortical cataract, nuclear cataract, and uh, sutural, Christmas tree, sunflower. So 
there are so many various kinds of cataract but not all these cataracts are visually significant again this is uh, a closer view of some of the cataracts this is a posterior subcapsular cataract this is a, a nuclear cataract and there's a mature cataract here the entire lens is very much cloudy and this is a christmas tree like cat cataract and this is a hyper mature cataract where as you can see the the dense nucleus is gravitated down and whereas the liquefied cortical matter is uh, dissolved and fill the rest of the capsule and uh, as i said not all cataracts need surgery uh, if they are not visually significant and if they do not affect patients visual requirement and if there is no other comorbidities that can be left alone without any interventions uh, some of the congenital cataracts uh, they are not visually significant and of course not uh, progressive of and therefore we can leave alone so then comes the question when do we need the cataract surgery the answer is when an individual has visual impairment due to cataract resulting in visual disability so there should be a visual impairment which is due to cataract and that should result in visual disability visual disability is a visual impairment which affects individuals activities of daily life occupation or etc here as you can see this depends on each and every individual so every individual's visual visual requirement is different so the visual uh, disability is different for example if you see a driver who has 66 or 69 vision but has early posterior subcapsular cataract may have significant glare and halo especially when uh, night time driving so in that case he may need cataract surgery in compare to a, a elderly woman who is just uh, roaming within the house may be happy with 618 624 vision and uh, may defer the cataract surgery so uh, clearly speaking there are optical indications and uh, therapeutic indications the optical indications the visual symptoms gradual loss of vision reduce color or contrast perception and glare and halos as i said it is not only the uh, quantity of vision but quality of vision is also important uh, with regard to the patient's visual requirements there are some therapeutic indications there we do cataract surgery uh, such as if the cataract is causing secondary glaucoma like in phacolytic glaucoma so phacomorphic glaucomas or if a cataract causing uh, poor fundal visualization so that we cannot assess the fundus or manage the fundal pathologies like diabetic retinopathy in that case we may do cataract surgery in order to get a better fundal visualization surgery of course we do a uh, phacoemulsification and iul implantation this surgery is done under local anesthesia through a very small incision it's about 2.2 millimeters or maybe sometimes 2.6 millimeters and uh, you need to encourage people with cataract to have these cataract surgeries done there's nothing to fear about it, in fact this is the most successful surgery uh, most successful outcome of all the surgeries in the world achieving about 98 to 99% of uh, success of course there are complications there can be but the success rate is uh, around 98 to 99% there are certain instances where we may not be able to do the phaco emulsification then we do what is called extra capsular cataract extraction there we need to make a, a relatively large incision about uh, 13 millimeters and uh, take out the entire lens in bulk and uh, implant an artificial lens and of course this need suturing and uh, rarely we perform uh, what is called lensectomy so intracapsular cataract extraction where we take out the lens and the capsule uh, both together and uh, do a second IUL implantation so mostly what we do is phacoemulsification with a very high success rate so uh, just uh, educate the public or the people with cataract uh, there's nothing to worry and uh, encourage them to have cataract surgeries to avoid what is called preventable blindness. 
And uh, next we will uh, talk about glaucoma. Glaucoma is a progressive neurodegenerative disease affecting the optic nerve with characteristic changes in the optic nerve head and corresponding visual field loss. So there are some uh, important words here, which is a progressive neurodegenerative condition affecting the optic nerve head and there should be corresponding visual field loss. And uh, it is not synonymous with raised intraocular pressure. That is just a one feature of glaucoma. Uh, so don't go away that high intraocular pressure is glaucoma. Of course not. And uh, so we call glaucoma silent killer of vision. This is a basic classification of glaucoma. It can be open angle, low angle closure, depending on the uh, open or closure of the anterior chamber angle. And it can be primary or secondary. Angle closure can also be primary or secondary. So we call uh, primary open angle glaucoma, or we can call secondary angle closure glaucoma. And there are so many causes for this uh, open angle and angle closure glaucomas, but this is the basic classification of glaucoma. And there is a, a something called glaucoma triad. As I said, raised intraocular pressure is not synonymous with glaucoma. And here, uh, race IOP is one feature where the intraocular pressure is more than 21 millimeters mercury. The normal range is about 10 to 21. And if it is more than uh, 21, we consider it is high intraocular pressure. And that can be seen in glaucomas except for normal tension glaucomas. And the second feature is abnormal disc appearance or the glaucomatous disc damage. Uh, there are several features I will uh, discuss uh, with the pictures later, the, namely cup disc ratio asymmetry and large cup to disc ratio for disc size and integrity of the neuroretinal rim, uh, notching and thinning, disc hemorrhages versus burnating and peripapillary atrophy. These are all features of glaucomatous disc damage and there should be corresponding visual field defects. They can be nasal steps, paracentral scotomas, aqueous scotomas, attitudinal scotomas, or residual temporal or central island of vision as seen in uh, advanced glaucoma. Uh, as primary care physicians or the first contact care doctors, I think uh, everyone should be quite competent in direct ophthalmoscopy. And when you assess the fundus with direct ophthalmoscopy, this is how you should assess the disc with regard to the glaucoma. Basically, you need to see the uh, size of the disc, shape of the disc, color of the disc, and this uh, uh, assessment for the glaucoma. So this red circle shows off the entire area of the disc, and you can assess the vertical diameter of the lens, rough assessment. And this uh, blue circle is the, uh, covers the cup which consists of neuroglial tissue or the supportive tissue within the optic nerve head. And between this red and the blue circle is the neuroretinal rim, which consists of axons of the retinal ganglion cells, which is the through uh, neuronal tissues of the optic nerve. So what is important is the amount of true neuronal tissues or the neuroretinal rim within this optic disc. So we assess the diameter of the disc uh, ratio to the diameter of the cup. So basically the, uh, the vertical is more quite more important than the horizontal diameter. So we assess vertical cup to disc ratio. Uh, it can be generally about, uh, we can say it is 0.3 to 0.4 like, but that all depend on the size of the disc. Uh, smaller disc, uh, smaller disc, uh, cup disc ratio is quite more significant than a cup disc ratio of a larger disc. Uh, this is a picture to assess the cup disc ratio. As you can see here, this is the entire thing is the disc. And this entire, this central uh, whitish or the yellowish part is the cup. The cup disc ratio here is about 0.5. Again, this is a clear picture. This entire thing is the disc and this is central part is the cup and the, this, uh, the pinkish area is the neuroretinal rim. 
and uh, you can uh, assess the cup disk ratio. The most important thing is the integrity of the neuroretinal rim, which consists of, as I said, the axons of the uh, uh, retinal uh, ganglion cells, which consisting of the optic nerve, which is uh, thickest inferiorly and then superior and then nasal and then temporal. So if you assess the integrity of this uh, uh, neuroretinal rim, which obeys the Eason rule, inferior thickest, then superior, then nasal, then temporal. So always assess whether this disc complies with the Eason rule. Uh, these are some changes in the uh, optic disc with glaucoma. There is quite early cupping in this disc as about uh, 0.6 cup disc ratio. Again here there is about 0.6 cup disc ratio. Uh, and again another uh, disc with early damage about 0.6 cup disc ratio with the flame shaped hemorrhages at the disc. And uh, here there are some uh, no fiber layer defects as well. This is quite a moderate glaucomatous disc here. As you can see, there is thinning in the neuroretinal rim inferior and superior. Here it is more visible. The inferior neuroretinal rim is, uh, has quite thinned out here. The cup disc ratio about 0 0.75, 0 0.8 like. As you can see, this should be the thickest inferior, but it is thinnest inferior. So there is a glaucomatous disc damage here. This is advanced uh, glaucomatous disc damage. You can see uh, overall cup disc ratio is about 0.9 with a severe thinning inferior and superior associated with peripapillary atrophy, which is uh, atrophy area around the optic disc. Here again, there's a severe thinning, uh, superior and inferior with a 0.9 cupping and peripapillary atrophy. Again, this is another picture of a glaucomatous disc damage with a 0.9 Cupping with severe inferior and superior uh, thinning with peripapillary atrophy. So when you are doing direct ophthalmoscopy, you can assess the integrity of the neuroretinal rim, the superior and inferior thinnings, and the amount of the cup disc ratio and the asymmetry of the cup disc ratio between the two eyes. If the cup disc ratio is asymmetry is more than two, uh, then that is quite significant. For example, if one eye has cup disc ratio of 0.3 and other eye has cup disc ratio of 0.7, then of course there is a asymmetry in the cup disc ratio, which is uh, quite significant. And these are some examples of uh, visual field defects seen in uh, glaucoma. Here, this uh, central, this, this is the blind spot. And uh, you can see a nasal uh, step here. This is kind of an early glaucomatous damage. And uh, this is the blind spot, and this is in the uh, in the left eye. There's a paracentral scotoma here, and there's a temporal wedge-like wedge-shaped scotoma here. There's altitudinal field defect, which means the entire superior half of the uh, visual field is lost. And there's arcuate uh, defect, and there's advanced glaucoma with relatively spare in the central island of small part of the vision. And uh, the most important thing in the visual fields is these visual field defects obey the horizontal midline. They don't uh, cross the horizontal midline as compared to the neurological type of visual fields where they obey the vertical midline. Uh, the most important thing is these glaucoma patients are mostly asymptomatic. That's why we call them uh, silent, call it silent killer of vision. Since they become advanced stage, they don't present. And they present with uh, advanced stages of glaucoma with uh, uh, tunnel vision. Therefore, and by that time, there's very little that we can do. Uh, only thing is acute glaucomas can present uh, early, then make them, they can present with uh, painful red eyes, clouding of vision associated with ipsilateral headache, nausea, vomiting, and uh, so these kind of patients mostly uh, present into OPD setup with a very high sudden onset, high uh, eye pain plus headaches, and they may be end up in medical wards doing all sorts of investigations, including CTs and MRIs. And, uh, but uh, ultimately they can be, uh, be diagnosed as acute glaucomas. For example, acute angle closure attacks, faculty glaucomas and phacomorphic glaucomas. 
So things to remember here is if patient coming with sudden onset of severe headache, painful red eye, just have a look at the eye. And if the eye is looking congested, red and uh, cloudy cornea, just think of acute glaucoma as well and refer patient to a uh, eye unit rather than planning for uh, all sort of investigations. These are some examples uh, of acute glaucoma. This patient has congested red dye, hazy cornea, mid-dilated and non-reactive pupil, and he will have very poor vision. And again, there's another patient with the diffusely congested dye, hazy cornea. And uh, in this patient, there's a diffusely congested dye, hazy cornea, and you can see there's a mature cataract. So these two patients are having angle closure glaucoma attacks, and this patient is having a, a faculitic glaucoma attack. So if a patient coming with like this, just have a look at the eye, and if it looks so congested with these hazy corneas and uh, get an ophthalmological opinion before proceeding with other investigations. Uh, so the take home message is glaucoma screening, since it is not, uh, it, is, it has a long silent phase, we have to do the glaucoma screening in order to detect them early. All above 40 years should be screened every five to 10 years. And if they have positive family screen, family history, they should be screened every five years or so. Or if they have secondary causes, mostly they are followed up in ophthalmological clinics and we need to screen them uh, according to their uh, the reasons, such as long-term steroid use, ocular trauma, or VITs. So everybody above 40 years should have an glaucoma screening every, every five to 10 years. And if they have a positive family history, and then uh, we need to screen quite more frequently. So the take home message, glaucoma is a silent killer of vision. They present at that advanced stage where we can do very little. Therefore, be a detective to spot the killer. So practice direct ophthalmoscopy in your routine clinic practice and do optic disc evaluation, and which can be done in, with a direct ophthalmoscope in a dilated fundal examination. And if you have any doubt, you can uh, refer the patient to the nearest eye unit for further evaluation. And next we will uh, move on to uh, another very important topic, diabetic eye disease. Diabetic eye diseases are a group of conditions that can affect people with diabetes mellitus and all form of diabetic eye diseases have the potential to cause severe visual loss and blindness. So this include diabetic retinopathy, diabetic macular edema, cataract and glaucoma. We have dealt uh, with these two earlier and they are more prone for infections, ocular surface infections and intraocular infections as well. Diabetic retinopathy, if somebody asks what is diabetic retinopathy, the answer is it is a microangiopathic complication of diabetes mellitus affecting the retinal circulation. There are some patho pathophysiological changes within the uh, retinal microcirculation. They include loss of pericytes uh, within the retinal uh, arterial system and thickening of the basement membrane and increased permeability, which results in both microvascular leakage and occlusion. This is the pathophysiology of diabetic retinopathy giving rise to all these uh, complications. And this is a simple classification of diabetic retinopathy. As medical officers, I think everybody should be familiar with this classification. This is uh, the classification that we are used for the diagnosis and management purposes, as well as research and study purposes. Either they don't have any diabetic retinopathy or they maybe have non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy or proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So NPDR is again divided into mild, moderate, and severe. PDR is divided into early, high risk, and advanced PDR. Everybody should be familiar with this International Diabetic Retinopathy Disease Severity Scale, which as I said, is the scale that we are using for diagnosis and management purposes, as well as research purposes. There's no abnormality, of course, there is no diabetic retinopathy. And uh, NPDR, or the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, divided into three, as I said earlier, mild, moderate, and severe. Mild is there's, there are only microaneurysms. Severe is there is four to one rule. Four means 
more than 20 intraretinal hemorrhages in each of the four quadrants. In each of the quadrants of the eye, there are more than 20 intraretinal hemorrhages, that is four. Two is there's definitive venous beading, venous changes in two or more quadrants, and one is presence of prominent intraretinal microvascular abnormalities in one or more quadrants. So this is four to one rule. So if they have if they have four to one rule, either one of the uh, three, then they fall into severe NPDR. In between the mild and moderate is uh, mild and uh, severe is the moderate NPDR. And then the PDR or the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Uh, there's one of the followings: presence of retinal neovascularization, uh, retinal uh, within the disc or uh, elsewhere in the retina or angle new vessels at the angle or new vessels in the iris. So presence of new vascularization will uh, fall them into PDR category and presence of vitreal and uh, vitreous and preretinal hemorrhages. So we will go through some pictures for you to become uh, familiar with these uh, signs. In this picture, you can see there are a lot of uh, dot-like hemorrhages. These are the presence of uh, microaneurysms and there are some blot-like hemorrhages these are the presence of intraretinal bleeding, hemorrhages. As you can see, if you draw a line uh, vertically and horizontally across the uh, macula, that divides the retina into four quadrants. And if you roughly assess, in each of these four quadrants, there are more than uh, 20 uh, microaneurysms or hemorrhages. If you just draw a line vertically, horizontally, in each of the quadrant, there are more more than 20 microaneurysms of uh, hemorrhages. So this retina falls into severe NPDR category. There is the, the rule number four. In this uh, fundus, you can see there's a lot of exudates here, uh, quite close to the macula and some intraretinal hemorrhages and microaneurysms. And here, this explains the venous changes uh, the dilatation and tortuosity of the veins and beading. You can see the beaded appearance in these veins here. So presence of venous beading in one or more quadrant, in two or more quadrant falls the patient into uh, severe NPDR category. And this is a fundal fluorescing angiogram photo to show the intraretinal microvascular abnormality or the ERMA, presence of ERMA in one quadrant. Uh, is falling the patient into a severe NPDR category. And this is again a patient with, there are a lot of intraretinal hemorrhages, a lot of exudates all around, and a lot of microaneurysms and uh, hard exudates, looping capillaries and some venous changes, venous beading here. So this patient has severe NPDR. And this is the presence of proliferative diabetic retinopathy where you can see the presence of new vessels. These are abnormal, friable, fan-like new vessels, which can be on the disc or within one disc diameter of the uh, disc area, and that categorizes new, vascular, uh, new vascularization on the disc or NVD, or there can be this kind of new vascularization elsewhere in the retina, as you can see here. So we call them NVE, new vascularization elsewhere. And this is NVD, new vascularization on the disc. And again, there's another patient with NVE. There's new vascularization elsewhere in the fundus. And there's severe NVD here. And this patient has pre-retinal hemorrhages here on the surface of the retina, as well as some vitreous hemorrhage. So this patient fall into, again, into PDR category. And this is a picture of the advanced diabetic retropathy where there is uh, fibrovascular uh, tissue formation and uh, tractional tractions on the retina with tractional detachment. And this is kind of a severe uh, or the advanced PDR. So important thing is to remember is uh, screen for diabetic retropathy. As you know, uh, when we come to uh, these stages, there's little much we can do. So it's really important for diabetic retinopathy screening. The international guideline is for type one diabetes, we should screen them within five years of diagnosis and then annually thereafter or as appropriately if they have diabetic retinopathy. 
for type 2 diabetes, we should screen them on diagnosis and then annually thereafter. The reason is type 2 diabetes have a long subclinical phase where it go, uh, which has been there undetected. So quite a significant number of patients will have diabetes retinopathy on diagnosis. Uh, whereas type 1 diabetes have a very short subclinical phase and very little patients will have uh, retinopathy on diagnosis. So, so type 1 within five years, type 2 on diagnosis and then annually thereafter or uh, as appropriately if they have diabetes retinopathy. And uh, gestational diabetes mellitus or diabetes in pregnancy, they should be screened on the first antenatal clinic visit. And then if they have no diabetic retinopathy, should be screened again around 28 weeks of uh, POA. Or if they have the diabetes retinopathy, then uh, screen as accordingly. And uh, this is really important, the system, uh, the management of diabetic retinopathy. It has two folds, the systemic management and ocular management uh, specifically. So systemic management as shown in these landmark uh, clinical trials, UKPDS, DCCTO occurred trials, there's a very significant role in systemic management. The optimic, uh, optimum control of systemic risk factors like uh, strict control of blood sugar, uh, tight control of blood pressures, lipids and correction of anemia, and engage in regular physical exercise and stop smoking. This uh, do really important because uh, whatever we do as eye surgeons will not be uh, quite useful or efficient uh, or effective if the patient's systemic uh, management is not uh, optimized. So as uh, primary care physicians, uh, it is really important for you to uh, get uh, involved in the systemic management of diabetic retropathy. So specific ocular management, uh, as I said, uh, no, no diabetic retinopathy, mild NPDR or moderate NPDR is just the systemic management. When it comes to severe NPDR or maybe PDR, uh, we consider doing uh, retinal, panretinal photocoagulation or sometimes uh, if it is quite advanced uh, surgery, the vitrectomy. So that is specific ocular management. And then uh, we'll talk about something about the diabetic macular edema, which is as a consequence of diabetic retinopathy, uh, there, we, there can be a swelling in the macula, uh, which is called diabetic macular edema. As you can see here, there's the macula. There's uh, quite a lot of retinal thickening and uh, thickening and swelling within the region of the macula. And here, there are a lot of hard exudates, retinal thickening and swelling. This, of course, uh, you can see clearly when we are examining with the slit lamp, uh, when we have the, this 3D view, we can see there's a lot of macular edema or the swelling. This is a, a cross-section, this is a, what is called optical coherence tomography or the OCT, which gives a cross-sectional uh, study of the macula. As you can see, there's a lot of swelling within the layers of the retina and just under the retina also. So this is a patient with uh, diabetic macular edema. The treatment options, uh, this is, of course, diabetic macular edema specific ocular management. We do uh, laser treatment for focal uh, macular edema. Or if there is diffuse macular edema, we do uh, intraventrial injections, including anti vegf or steroid injections. Or if they have advanced diseases with uh, tractions, we might uh, think of doing vitrectomy and delamination with the uh, uh, peeling of the lam lamina. So uh, the things to remember here is in diabetic retinopathy, important thing is to how to screen properly. We still you see quite a lot of patients coming quite advanced uh, right retinopathy. They have not been assessed for diabetic uh, retinopathy after diagnosis quite for a long time, sometimes uh, five, six years, even after 10 years until they come with complications, their eye have never been screened. So it's quite important for uh, screening for diabetic retinopathy and get involved in systemic management of diabetic retinopathy. And then uh, we will talk about some other common uh, presentations to OPD and GP setup. Uh, one important thing is loss of vision. 
is somebody come into your practice with loss of vision uh, take a brief history whether it's acute loss of vision or whether it is a gradual loss of vision if it is acute is it whether within seconds or minutes or within days or weeks sometimes patient might come uh, complaining just loss losing the vision within seconds within minutes is a very sudden event so that is quite very important when compared to gradual uh, deterioration of vision over a period of months or years and whether it is painful or painless and especially central peripheral or transient versus prolonged whether it is a transient loss of vision which uh, just losing vision and comes and goes like or whether it stays there on long term basis and then at opd setup you can uh, assess these patients with a visual acuity with a standard standard snellens chart uh, unaided and with the spectacles and with pinhole correction and you can just do a torch examination to see whether there is any abnormality on the ocular surface if you are familiar with do a pupillary reflex and red reflex examination with the torch and uh, if possible do a fundal examination with the direct ophthalmoscope this everything can be done at a opd setup to diagnose whether this is a quite acute uh, or very emergency situation or whether uh, where you have to refer the patient to i unit quite urgently or whether you can wait there are a whole lot of causes for uh, loss of vision uh, one thing is a uh, refractive error there is a poor vision maybe a incidental finding and the vision improve is the pinhole and there is no gross abnormality of the eye when we do a refraction and uh, give spectacles there are basically three kinds of refractive errors myopic errors hypermetropic errors and astigmatism and uh, there are some other conditions with corneal ectetic disorders and like keratoconus which is we do in uh, eye care is quite, quite important at opd setup and this is really uh, other thing is painless gradual loss of vision with a normal red reflex uh, there's slow uh, loss of vision and which is painless one example is chronic open angle glaucoma as you can see here there's advanced glaucomatous disc damage where the patient has significant loss of peripheral vision and another gradual painless loss of vision with normal red reflex uh, as i told you earlier uh, diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema that also uh, one cause for gradual loss of vision another cause for gradual loss of vision is macular macular degeneration where the center of the macula undergoes de 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 degenerative changes and uh, another cause is optic atrophy gradual pale loss of vision and uh, the other things like ocular surface diseases the whole lot of ocular surface diseases so this can be diagnosed just by a torch examination on the cornea if you see a clear cornea or whether there's anything on the cornea and uh, the other reason is a cataract as i said earlier and uh, painless but sudden loss of vision transient episodes uh, it can be amaurosis fugax which is quite important it is kind of a transient ischemic attack at affecting the retinal circulation or there is a condition called migraine sign migraine where uh, patients get visual symptoms without having headache so uh, that can be a cause for transient loss of vision the episodic pattern uh, and uh, the other is other causes are vitreous hemorrhages retinal detachment and uh, this is really important uh, painless sudden loss of vision uh, central retinal artery occlusion this is quite important for you all to be familiar because this is a ophthalmic emergency if we intervene on time like uh, basically within 4 to 5 5 hours then there is a chance of visual recovery patients will complaining of sudden profound visual loss which is acute event it is not a slow thing is just acute all of a sudden they lose vision and that is very profound loss of vision and if you can assess the uh, red reflex there is a significant relative afferent pupillary defect which is very obvious uh, if you 
if you know how to do the red reflex, uh, know how to do the uh, pupillary reflex, there is a significant uh, relative afferent pupillary defect. And if you just peep into the fundus, you can see a, a pale fundus with the central cherry red spot. If you can diagnose this central retinal artery or suspect central retinal artery, refer the patient to an uh, eye unit as urgent as possible. This is an ophthalmic emergency. If you intervene, there's a chance of uh, recovering vision to a certain extent. But if the time passes like more than five, six hours, then chances are very limited. And again, there's a, another cause for uh, sun loss of vision, central retinal artery occlusion, and other causes like uh, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, arteritic, non-arteritic, posterior, all these are causes for sudden and pro profound loss of vision. Optic neuritis and uh, cortical visual impairment. And this is a cause for pain, full sun loss of vision. As I said earlier, acute angle crossover glaucoma, patient coming with severe pain, congested dye, hazy cornea. Uh, so, just do a torch examination and if you suspect, refer the patient to our unit. And uh, then we will uh, talk with some other red dye causes. Just take a preceding history as to the patient, what has happened, whether it is painful or painless uh, red dye, whether the visual activity is normal or reduced. Uh, how about other symptoms like tearing, discharge, fever. There are again a whole lot of causes for the red dye starting from the conjunctiva, as in conjunctivitis, dry eyes, pterygium, subconjunctival hemorrhages, trauma, and then cornea, corneal abrasions, corneal foreign bodies, corneal lacerations, ulcers, keratitis, and then sclera, episcleritis, scleritis, and the inflammation within the eye, the iritis and iridocyclitis, and anterior chamber hyphemas, angle closure attacks, and uh, orbital cellulitis, acute dacryosis, cystitis. There are a whole lot of causes for red dye. So bas just basically do a torch examination. If you see an abnormal region, uh, refer the patients to the eye unit. Uh, pure and simple conjunctivitis, patient will have redness, gritty feeling, tearing and discharge. The important thing is vision is normal here and cornea is clear. Just uh, flash the torch light into the cornea and uh, you will see a clear cornea, crystal clear cornea, and vision is normal. So in that case, you may treat these patients with antibiotics and uh, lubricants, and ask the patient for the general hygiene and prevent the spread of the conjunctivitis. And if you see something on the cornea, it, can, it may be part of keratoconjunctivitis, which means the conjunctivi uh, conjunctivitis plus uh, that involvement of the cornea as well. In that case, vision may be blurry. So in these uh, cases, uh, just refer the patient to an eye unit. Common mistake that you should never do is never ever use steroids for undiagnosed ocular conditions. This is a common practice where we see patients are given probita N and betanol N. These are the common two kind of uh, combination eye drops, the steroid plus antibiotic combinations given for these un undiagnosed ocular conditions. Uh, we see quite a lot of patients with corneal ulcers are treated with these, and then uh, mind you, that can lead to devastating complications. The dry eyes, patient will complain of ocular discomfort, stinging and gritty feeling, and uh, photosensitivity, redness, and uh, of course the treatment is lubricants. Pterygium, this is a condition with, uh, there's a, uh, fibrovascular growth onto the cornea, which is classically on the nasal aspect of the eye. Rarely it can come from the uh, temporal aspect, which we call pseudoterygium, which happens due to the uh, ultraviolet light damage to the limbal stem cells. And then subsequently, these fibrovascular tissues grow onto the cornea. The management is early, early cases. We may uh, manage conservatively, ask the patients to avoid direct sunlight exposure. Uh, to use an umbrella or wide brimmed hat and use a ultraviolet filtering and fully covered sunglasses. Not just sunglasses, it should be ultraviolet filtering and fully covering sunglasses. If it uh, extends, as in, in this case, onto the cornea, when we call it grade three, then we do surgery. Uh, a subconjunctival hemorrhage is a again a, a, quite a common presentation. There's a diffuse uh, subconjunctival 
hemorrhagic patch can be due to trauma, eye rubbing, valsalva minus, or hypertension. If there is no other preceding history, a uh, patient can be managed conservatively. There is no treatment necessary, but just check the blood pressure. It can be due to sudden accelerated hypertension or other valsalva maneuvers. If it is due to uh, trauma, a uh, patient need to be evaluated for other, uh, other uh, damages of the trauma, so refer the patients to the eye unit. Corneal foreign bodies. Uh, if a patient coming with red eyes and gritty feeling, just if you flash the light onto the cornea, if you see something on the cornea, it may be a foreign body. So this need to be removed at the slit lamp and covered with antibiotics. And again, a patient coming with red eye, you flash the light onto the cornea and you see something on the cornea, it may be an early corneal ulcer and never ever use steroids in this kind of corneal ulcers. It can go rise to devastate, give rise to devastating complications. Patient might end up in losing the eye. And we have seen quite a lot of patients who has been treated with steroids uh, and ultimately losing the entire eye. So how much small the corneal ulcer is, refer to the eye unit. Uh, episcleritis, scleritis, these are maybe isolated or as part of systemic uh, conditions and uh, maybe systemic associations. So we manage them accordingly. And this is intraocular inflammation, iritis or iridocyclitis. Patient may come in with uh, specifically circumcorneal redness and bird vision and photophobia. This is in contrast to the conjunctivitis where you get redness more on the uh, phonesis and there's no blurred vision, there's no photophobia, but here in iritis or the iridocyclitis, basically the intraocular inflammation, patient will have blurred vision and photophobia. And again, orbital cellulitis, where there is periorbital swelling, signs of infl inflammation, pain, red dye, restricted eye movements, blurred vision, RAPD, and uh, patient may be having a fever and systemically illness. So uh, management involved with intravenous antibiotics and specific uh, uh, ophthalmological management. Again, uh, dacryocystitis, there is a painful swelling, just uh, inferior to the medial angle of the eye. And uh, this is kind of a acute dacryocystitis where the uh, lacrimal sac is blocked and then subsequently getting secondarily infected and treatment with, with uh, systemic antibiotics for sub subsequent surgery. <laughs> Another important uh, symptom patient coming to the OPD is seeing double. Uh, either it can be a vertical diplopia or a horizontal diplopia. There are a whole lot of causes for seeing double, uh, including neurological, neuromuscular, mechanical causes, including trauma, and patient need to be uh, have proper ophthalmic evaluation. There are a whole lot of causes here. And this is uh, another important uh, aspect, orbital and ocular trauma, because as first con contact care physicians, you, you will be the doctor who the patients are presenting to. Early management of this ocular trauma is really important because subsequent uh, specific ocular management, the ophthalmic management, uh, the success will depend on uh, the uh, early management. Types of trauma uh, can be physical or chemical trauma. Physical trauma can be blunt trauma or penetrating injuries or burns, chemicals or alkaline acids or other chemicals. Uh, physical trauma, as I said, can be blunt trauma with blunt objects like tennis balls, rubber balls, assault with bare hands or some other clubs like shuttlecocks, toy bullets, a whole lot of blunt objects can go uh, blunt trauma into the orbit or the eye and penetrating injuries with sharp objects like knives, scissors, pencils, eagles, cheeks, needles, shrapnels, uh, metal objects likewise. Uh, so blunt trauma it can do rise to a whole lot of uh, complications from uh, front to back into uh, up to the optic nerve. The orbital injuries, they can give rise to periorbital hematomas, lit lacerations, fractures, especially involved in the inferior or the medial, medial wall of the orbit. And uh, sometimes it can be associated with Lee 4 type 2 and type 3 fractures. And as this seen in this CT, there's a fracture of the inferior orbital wall and there's a classical 
uh, tear drop sign here. And if you compare it with the other side, there's a, a fracture in the inferior orbital wall. Lid lacerations. Lid lacerations can be involved in the lid margin or may not involve the lid margin. If it does not involve in the lid margin and if it is not very deep and it can be managed at OPD setup, you can just examine the eye to uh, see whether there is any associated ocular injuries. If there is no eyes associated ocular injuries, if it is isolated uh, lid laceration, not in all the margin, then you may be, you can uh, switch them at OPD setup. But if it is a deep laceration, which involves the muscles and the tendons, and if it involves the lid margins or the uh, canthus, or if it involves the lacrimal system, that has to be managed in an eye unit because proper alignment and uh, repair of the lacrimal uh, system, repair of the cantha is needed. So uh, do not attempt to suture these lacerations where they involve the uh, margins or the cantha or the lacrimal system. This is a picture of a lid laceration involving the margin. And the other thing I want to uh, tell is always assess for other uh, associated ocular injuries. This is a uh, lid margin uh, involving uh, lid laceration. This need to be managed in an eye unit. Uh, the proper alignment of the lid margin is really important for the proper function of the lid. And there's a quite a complex lid laceration involving both lid margins here. Luckily the globe seems to be intact. And other uh, blunt trauma, uh, they can go, give rise to subconjunctival hemorrhages, corneal contusions, high femurs, traumatic uveitis, angle recessions, iris sphincter tears, iridodonesis, lens subluxations, dislocations, vitreous hemorrhage, commotion retina, retinal tears. So there's a whole lot of uh, damages that can caused by blunt trauma from top to bottom. So they need to be assessed properly. And uh, yeah, this is a subconjunctival hemorrhage, as I explained earlier. This is a high femur where bleeding into the anterior chamber in the eye. Uh, there's uh, blood in the anterior chamber. And there's a dislocation of the lens here, as you can see. There's a retinal tear here and retinal detachment as a, reason, as a result of uh, blunt injury. And then uh, we'll move on to the penetrating injuries. And this uh, caused by sharp objects which travels through and through the eye, uh, like splinters, knives, uh, scissors, pencils, pins, likewise. And that can be also with uh, very high velocity projectiles, such as in blast injuries, small shrapners uh, and stones, and uh, yeah, thrown away when cutting grasses like that. Uh, the type of penetrating injuries, again, there can be conjunctival lacerations, partial thickness corneal laceration, full thickness corneal laceration, scleral lacerations, globe rupture with prolapse of intraocular contents and loss of intraocular contents, and maybe lacerations within uh, intraocular foreign bodies. This is a picture with a, a corneal laceration with prolapse of the iris through the corneal laceration here. Again, another picture of the corneal laceration here with a prolapse of, intra uh, prolapse of iris through the laceration. As you can see, there's a peaking of the pupil here. Again, there's a peaking of the pupil. If you just flash a torch onto the cornea, you will see there's abnormality and the abnormality on the ocular surface on the cornea, as well as there is the uh, peaking of the uh, iris. So suspect uh, penetrating injuries. Again, there's a clear uh, corneal laceration with uh, corneoscleral laceration, which is extending onto the sclera, bleeding. Uh, and here again, there's a corneal laceration here. Again, there's a cut cornea and that's cut through the through and through the cornea and the sclera. Again, this is a sutured corneal laceration. So uh, things to remember is patients suspected of having Penetrating eye injury should always be managed in an eye unit. The what as primary care physician, what you should do is uh, do not wash the eye or put any medication. Uh, just put a drop of drop of preservative free antibiotics if you have, like moxifloxacin preservative free, and put a sterile eye pad, and prepare the patient for surgery under general anesthesia. 
So if into a practice, if a patient coming with penetrating eye injury, you just flash the light, you see there is a damage in, in the eye. So do not go for further evaluation into detail of the examination. If you suspect penetrating eye injury, just put a preservative free antibiotic. And if you have a uh, sterile eye pad and keep the patient fasting and ask the patient to go to the nearest eye unit or refer the patient nearest eye unit. Uh, and if the patient has other medical records, ask the patient to take those records as well as a preparation for general anesthesia. Do not press the globe for any reason as that may cause prolapse of the intraocular contents and further and you may be damaging the eye uh, which has already damaged. And then chemical injuries and burns. So uh, the common uh, chemical agents are the acids, alkalines and other chemicals, acids such as acetic acids, sulfuric acids, alkalines such as lime and uh, thermal burns like fire incense sticks, hot oil, fire works. Chemical injuries, alkaline burns are more worse than the acid burns because they can uh, stay on the ocular surface quite for a long time and they can penetrate the cornea uh, might more worse than the acids. So management, again, this is really important This is because these patients are coming to your practice with uh, chemical injuries to your eye. So whatever you do in your practice has a really, really uh, uh, important in the ultimate visual outcome. So uh, do the ABC in case of serious systemic involvement, airway breathing circulation, and do a thorough irrigation of the eye with copious amount of clean fluid maybe water, maybe saline. So what is really important is do a very thorough uh, irrigation of the eye at least half an hour. Ideally speaking, we have to do the cleaning until the pH uh, becomes neutral or the litmus uh, papers become neutral. Uh, but practically we don't have that uh, facility. So uh, irrigate the eye as much as possible at least for half an hour with uh, uh, free flowing fluid like water or saline. And that has a real importance in the ultimate visual outcome. This is a patient with a severe alkaline burn. Uh, although the eye looks very white, this is very alarming because this entire conjunctiva sclera entire thing is uh, damaged, necrotic, and the blood supply to the entire anterior segment of the eye is damaged, compromised. So ultimately patient will end up in losing the eye. Thermal injuries, uh, common injuries like welding arcs and uh, I need no longer the burn patients. And so what we need to do is again, put a uh, copious amount of lubricants, topical antibiotic steroids. This is specific management at eye unit. Uh, And again, eye injuries is quite common at home, schools and road and workplace. It is very common everywhere. And take a good history and have a high degree of suspicion and along with careful examination, uh, do a, like at, at your setup, you can uh, examine the eye with a torch. And the other thing is never give steroids to a patient with a history of eye trauma and uh, yeah when in doubt, always refer. What is really important is prevention of eye injuries. Uh, always advise the patients or the public or whenever you come across with these risky uh, procedures, ask them to wear a protective uh, eyewear whenever they do these risky procedures. This is really important. Uh, so you can become involved in the uh, patient education uh, in the prevention of ocular trauma. Uh, just regular glasses will not be uh, effective enough. You, they need to be wear proper uh, protective eyewear. And there are the uh, miscellaneous conditions, small things that you may be encountering in your daily practice, like calaisians, which is uh, a swelling in the middle of the lid, which is a swelling due to the meibomian gland obstruction and uh, granulomatous inflammatory reaction. 
what you can uh, do is ask the patient to do a warm compressions about four to six times a day and apply uh, antibiotic ointment along the ligid margin. No point in applying on the skin. They have to apply along the lid margin after warm compressions for about two weeks. And if it is not settling, we might have to do incision and curettage under local anesthesia. And this is a sty commonly called, uh, which is uh, technically a hardy alarm, which is at the lid margin. This is due to the blockage and infection of the sweat glands and most resolve spontaneously, but you can help by doing warm compressions and giving antibiotic ointments applied along lid margins. Uh, this is a santhalesma, which is kind of a deposition of lipids and the cholesterol on the skin subcutaneous tissues. Ask the patient to do a lipid profile to see whether they have familial hypercholesterolemia. And uh, this is a cyst of mole. This is a small, uh, clear, small cyst with clear fluid uh, adjacent to the lid margin. Uh, they are originate from the gland of mole and it's a benign condition. If the patient is really worried, we can excise it. And this is a, a cyst of size, uh, which originate from the glands of size, again, a benign condition. In contrast to the cyst of mole, this uh, it has a, a solid appearance rather than a cystic appearance. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm willing for any questions if you have. Thank you very much sir, for that informative presentation. Uh, so it's time to enlighten your queries. Yeah. Uh, please uh, write your questions uh, clearly in the chat box. Uh, so I think we have already got two questions in the chat box. Right, okay. The first is, uh, what is the medical management of glaucoma? I think yeah. you have elaborated in the lecture. Yeah, med yeah the glaucoma, uh, I have not uh, elaborated in the lecture here. The medical management of glaucoma is uh, the first choice is anti-glaucoma medications. We will get into the glaucoma here. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the first choice is the anti-glaucoma medications. There are a whole array of medica medications, uh, prostaglandins uh, and uh, beta blockers likewise. So we do maximum uh, tolerable medical treatment with uh, following up with these uh, visual fields and OCTs. And if the patient is deteriorating with the maximum tolerable medical uh, treatment, then, there, then we go into the surgical treatment. Again, there are a whole lot of surgeries available, uh, including the trabeculectomy and uh, so trabeculectomy with mitomycin C. And there are special classes of glaucoma where we do uh, trabecular shunt procedures, and uh, uh, there's laser treatment options like argon laser <coughs> ALTs, argon laser treatment or selective laser trabecular plasty. So a lot of uh, surgical treatment is there uh, depending on the individual case. So the first line treatment is medical treatment with anti medications. And the important thing to remember is this treatment is for lifelong is not just for a few months, not for a few years. Since this is a, a chronic progressive condition, the patient need to be on medications lifelong. It's really important for the compliance because if you prescribe medications, uh, usually they tend to stop. Okay, we have given for three months and we have completed three months and then they stop and then they never turn up again to the glaucoma clinic and then uh, subsequently come with advanced stages. So it's really important to uh, advise the patients that this is a lifelong medication and they need to be in regular follow-up in the glaucoma clinic to assess the progression. Uh, and uh, the, sometimes when we use a medication, they can go secondary resistance. So we need to change the medications time to time. So it's really important for them to follow up in a medical uh, med uh, glaucoma clinic and medications to be used lifelong. And yeah, and okay, I hope so that the, uh, answers the questions. So next query, I think it has several questions. Yeah. How to screen patients on long-term steroids? What are the things to look for? What is the minimal period to be on steroid treatment to screen? Uh, yeah, 
the long term steroid use whether it is a topical steroids used on the ocular ocular surface or whether it is a systemic steroids uh, the complications of two more two most important complications are raised intraocular pressure and subsequent glaucoma and the other thing is uh, development of the cataract uh there's no uh, long term steroid usage but there's no time limit like so if the patient is on this much of steroids for this long they will get cataract there's no such thing basically if a patient is on long term steroids basically if they are on uh, systemic steroids and if the dose is high then the risk is high if the dose is very low then the risk is low and even topical steroids depending on the potency of the uh, steroids for example if the somebody is on uh, dexamethasone topically about uh, 33% of the patients will become steroid responders and uh, weaker weaker steroids like fluoromethalone then uh, and that has a uh, quite a lesser or uh, lotapredinol there's a lesser risk of developing glaucoma or the cataract so the thing is uh, uh, it depends on the potency and the the dosage and the duration of the uh, steroid usage and uh, so basically patients on long term steroids for example with systemic inflammatory conditions uh, they need to be uh, uh, screened for glaucoma and uh, cataract from time to time there is no specific time period as such and uh, if the patient is symptomatic of course blurring vision uh, they should be referred otherwise like once in uh, every few months like 4 to 6 months maybe okay so, so the next question is uh, what are the types of lubricants we can use oh there are a whole lot of lubricants again uh, that depends on the situation uh, ocular lubricants uh, you can use uh, there are preservative uh, free lubricants and preserve preserve lubricants and uh, for example what we use in uh, commonly refreshed tears refresh uh, liquid gel octave and uh, cysteine ultra likewise that again depends on how the patient's clinical condition is how severe the condition is like uh, if the patient has uh, quite a simple dry eyes then uh, something like refreshed tears or octave can be used which is uh, available commercially there is no generic name as such these are all uh, combinations of uh, medications so uh, quite commonly what we use is uh, uh, refreshed tears refreshed liquid gel octave cysteine ultra cystia and uh, tears naturally there is quite a lot of things and uh, it's again uh, individual and subjective uh, treatment some patient do respond to one kind of lubricant drops and uh, they don't tolerate the other one so basically it will be uh, sometimes it may be on trial and error basis then uh, some are comfortable with some lubricants and not with the others the next question is uh, what's the management of scleral lacerations scleral laceration of course uh, surgery the repair under general anesthesia patient is uh, taken to the eye theater and uh, should be uh, repaired as early as possible whenever the fasting is completed uh, repair under general anesthesia in an a unit yeah next question can migraine cause glaucoma migraine there is a clear association of migraine with uh, normal tension glaucoma uh, normal tension glaucoma is a condition where the intraocular pressure is within the normal range but still patient has glaucomatous disc damage and corresponding visual field defects and uh, there is a clear association that uh, with glauco with uh, migraine because that is again uh, migraine is again a vascular phenomenon so this affects the optic nerve blood supply and uh, that can give rise to glaucoma even though the pressures are not high uh, the next question how do we manage systemic glaucoma size how do we manage cyst of size yeah cyst of yeah. size again cyst of size and cyst of mole both are benign conditions but if the patient is worried uh, uh, if the patient is concerned about the cosmesis we can remove them under local anesthesia uh, we do uh, give local and excise and send for histology and uh, excision of course we have to do it completely otherwise it can recur 
another question on glaucoma. Can uh, glaucoma get as familiar? Some patients complain family history of blindness. Yes, there is a clear association, uh, clear family history for glaucoma. That again, I, I uh, explained here, uh, screening for glaucoma, positive family history, they need to be screened every five years, like or every quite frequently. There's a genetic association because the glaucoma is a multifactorial condition. Intraocular pressure is just one thing. The other things are the positive family history, the genetics, and the blood supply to the optic nerve head, uh, the thickness of the, what we call the lamina cribrosa, the part of the sclera uh, that uh, the optic nerve passes through. And uh, so, which is a multifactorial condition. And of course the genetics plays a major role here. Uh, yeah, patients with family history, they need to be screened quite frequently. Okay. They can have positive family history of blindness due to glaucoma as well. Again, on glaucoma, can myopia cause glaucoma? Yes, that is again a clear association. Uh, myopia, uh, they can have uh, more, quite more frequent than uh, primary open angle glaucomas. There is association. Next question, could you please tell about uveitis? Uveitis is uh, inflammation within the uvea. And let me get you the slide here. Yeah, Inf uveitis is inflammation of the uvea. Uveal tissues is, uh, uh, there are three kinds of uveal tissues. One thing is iris, the other thing is the ciliary body, the other thing is the choroid. Uveitis is inflammation of one of the, these conditions, either uh, iris, if it is iris, it, uh, we call it iritis. If it is involved in the iris and the ciliary body, we call it iridocyclitis. And if it is in the choroid, uh, we call it simple uveitis. So it can be again anterior uveitis and pos uh, posterior uveitis or pan uveitis. If it is iritis and iridocyclitis only, then that is anterior uveitis. If it is the, the choroiditis, then that can then become posterior uveitis. If it is involving all everything, then that is uh, pan uveitis. And uh, it may be as part of the ocular condition or maybe as part of a systemic inflammatory conditions and uh, it can be isolated or as I said the uh, systemic inflammatory conditions or maybe ocular inflammatory uh, infective causes. Uh, yeah as I said here they present with uh, specifically circumcorneal injections and uh, pain, blurred vision, photophobia and uh, floaters. Uh, yeah so that is basically a simple uh, explanation of uveitis. Then the next question is, what are the common antibiotic ointments used? Yeah, con common antibiotic ointment, we can use chloramphenicol or uh, fusithalmic ointment on the ocular surface. Uh, and uh, if the infection is quite severe, we can use tobramycin ointment. And uh, for a certain conditions, we use tetracycline ointments. Uh, those are the basically common ointments we use apart from the drops, uh, common ointments we use, chloramphenicol, uh, or fusithalmic, and the topromycin, tetracyclines, likewise. So next question, if patient complains of curtains coming down like visual loss, what is the cause? That again, uh, there's a whole lot of causes. Curtain coming down means the visual field is losing from above to uh, bottom. So there can be a retinal uh, cause within the retina, uh, like retinal detachment, or within the optic nerve, like in uh, optic neuritis, or it can be uh, uh, something compressing the optic nerve, compressive lesions, or it can be uh, sometimes uh, in the visual path lesions affecting the uh, so up, uh, inferior part of the visual pathway. Then, uh, yeah, can be from the retina into the uh, visual cortex or the visual pathway up to the cortex. Uh, yeah, conditions like retinal detachment, optic neuritis, 
compressive lesions and uh, cerebral vascular accidents. These are the common causes. The next question, if there are changes in the eyes but no frequent attacks of migraine, does he need treatments of glaucoma? If there are changes in the eyes, I uh -huh. think he means glaucoma changes, but no frequent attacks of migraine. Yes. Does he need treatment for glaucoma? Of course, if there is uh, glaucomatous changes, whether they have migraine or not, it doesn't matter, but we have to treat the glaucoma. Migraine is maybe a just an association of uh, normal tension glaucoma. Patient doesn't need to have migraine to treat. If they, if they have uh, glaucomatous changes, glaucomatous disc damage, glaucomatous visual field defects, and if it is progressing, then of course patient needs treatment. The last question, sir. Diabetic retinopathy, any guideline to refer for general practice? Yeah. This is uh, really important. I'm glad that somebody asked that question. Yeah, this is what they should be familiar with. Everybody must be familiar with International Diabetes Retinopathy Disease Severity Scale. That's why I explained this taking quite a time. Uh, to simplify this, Basically, diabetic retinopathy is divided into three categories, either no diabetic retinopathy and then non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which again divide into mild, moderate, and severe, and then proliferative diabetic retinopathy, early, high risk, and advanced. And uh, this is how we classify it. Uh, so everybody need to be familiar with this international diabetic retinopathy disease severity scale, not only uh, eye doctors, but everybody, because in your practice, in your uh, GP practice, and pay, uh, they are managing diabetic patients, and uh, they need to be familiar with these changes. As I showed in these images here, I showed the changes that they see, and then I showed how uh, they should be screened. This is the uh, WHO guidelines for screening for type 2 diabetes because more than 20% of the patients with type 2 will have uh, diabetic retinopathy on diagnosis. Therefore, type 2 diabetes should be screened on diagnosis. Uh, they can be done by a, 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 a normal doctor, no, it may not be an eye doctor, uh, dilated fundal examination with a direct ophthalmoscope. If you see any signs, then you can refer, but if you don't see anything if you, I mean, if you are quite sure about the fundus examination and if you see a normal fundus, you can follow them up every annually. But if you see any changes, you can refer them to the uh, nearest eye unit for uh, for the evaluation. And the type one diabetics, uh, there's hardly a very small number will have diabetic retinopathy on diagnosis. So ideally we have to screen them within five years of diagnosis and then annually thereafter. So this is the take home message for uh, type one and type two diabetes, how to do the uh, screening. And once we have done a study in National Ohio Hospital sometime back, the first uh, diabetic retinopathy screening, the average is after seven years of diagnosis, which is uh, not acceptable like patients have been diagnosed to have diabetes for seven years on average before they have their first uh, diabetic retinopathy screening, and which is uh, not, the, not the accepted uh, method. So on diagnosis, because I know these all the uh, primary care physicians, they manage diabetics. So on diagnosis, do a dilated fundal examination. And uh, if you see any signs, you can refer, or otherwise uh, you can screen them every year. And uh, be familiar with these signs and be familiar with the classification. So no diabetic retinopathy, you can uh, uh, follow up in your clinic. Mild diabetic retinopathy, if you are sure that is mild uh, diabetic retinopathy, then again, management is uh, just follow up every uh, annually like, moderate uh, NPDR every six months like, severe NPDR of course, uh, moderate to severe NPDR of course refer to the I, I units. 
and uh, the other thing is uh, uh, so part of the management lies on primary care physicians as i said earlier the systemic management optimum control of systemic risk factors lifestyle modifications so that is again uh, part to be done by the primary care physicians so i hope that answers that question yes sir and there are two more questions uh, is there any treatment for jft jft yes sir what do you mean by jft is it just a four wheel telangiectasia i think so sir they have only put the abbreviation okay i i suppose ophthalmologically we abbreviate jft as juxta four wheel telangiectasia and uh, there are two kinds of juxta four wheel telangiectasia which is a uh, dry type and the wet type the dry type is the most common which includes a uh, Uh, my macular atrophy of course if there is macular atrophy uh, there is no specific treatment as such other than this low depending on the visual acuity low visual aids but if it is a wet type which involves the uh, uh, cystoid macular edema of course then uh, we can go ahead with uh, the uh, cystic uh, the intraocular anti vegf treatment uh, depending or the laser treatment depending where the jft uh, is so that is basically a specific ocular management i hope that jft the person is referring to juxta four wheel telangiectasia so last question uh, is there uh, what is the treatment for blind spot treatment for blind spot blind spot i mean that is a physiological condition you don't need any treatment that is physiology you know the optic nerve head we it lies so in the visual field that is projected onto the temporal side of the visual field and uh, the blind spot of one eye is compensated by the uh, the normal uh, visual field of the other eye so uh, practically speaking there is no treatment and you don't need anything to be done and that is a normal thing it's a physiological thing yes thank you sir i think we have no more queries so i would like to thank dr mahesh jagamage for his excellent and very informative presentation on behalf of gmos re knowledge academy and i would like to present a token of appreciation uh, to dr mahesh jagamage and thank you very much sir for this uh, informative presentation thank you very much for the uh, nice listening and that those questions that you were quite very enthusiastic thank you very much yes sir. thank you sir so here we are signing off today thank you all for your participation have a good day and stay safe thank you